This is R.J. Rush Dooney, Easy Chair Number 148, June 4, 1987. Otto Scott and I are going to discuss a subject this evening which is very important for us to be informed about, the French Revolution. The French Revolution, in a sense, brought the modern age into focus. Everything that had developed since 1660 with the Enlightenment and with Romanticism came to focus in the French Revolution, and we are today living in the world that revolution created. All the absurdities and the insanities of our age, its errors, are traceable to that event. Otto Scott has written a book a few years back on Robespierre, The Voice of Virtue, which is, of course, about the French Revolution. We still have a very limited number of copies which can be ordered from Ross House Books. Now, by way of uh, a preface, we need to recognize that the French Revolution, uh, Revolution was a logical development of the modern age, of the thinking of men like John Locke, who to a very great degree was, especially in France, regarded as the father of the Enlightenment and the grandfather of revolution. John Locke believed that man has a morally neutral nature. And therefore, by what we now call brainwashing, in which he called education, man can be made into whatever the educational system chooses to make of him. Locke created modern education. He also created the modern Pharisee and hypocrite. The man who believes himself to be the voice of reason and the voice of virtue and therefore has the right to reshape the world according to his thinking. Now, all this came to focus in the French Revolution. It is with us still. We need to understand the significance of that event in order to counteract it because it is going to destroy us otherwise. Otto, uh, let's hear from you now about the implications of that event. Well, the French Revolution has never stopped. I think that's the first thing to uh, say about it. I was astonished when I began to research that period at how contemporary it is, how modern it is. As I read it, I thought, I'm living this. It was like the morning's newspaper. It was like the evening TV. Astonishing. We have never gotten out of it. It never really came to an end. What happened, of course, uh, in a general way, was that eventually the Hunter was overtaken by Napoleon and Napoleon tried to put the eggs back into the shell. He tried to unscramble the omelet. He restored the aristocracy or an aristocracy. He restored the church. He restored the army. He restored the courts. He restored the absolute rule of the ancien regime. But the whole country remained divided. All those who had been downcast by the revolution and had lost their properties and their estates resented the Napoleonic regime. All the people that Napoleon elevated were considered arrivistes or, you know, nouveau riche and all that. And under the surface, the argument between left and right continued through France forever. It broke the back of France 
it divided the people ir in irrevocably and the argument that the revolution was a good thing was raised in the chamber of deputies by Clemenceau who was the leader uh, in the final victorious phases of World War I his father knew some of the revolutionaries Clemenceau was a man in his 70s in 1917 he was 75 his father knew some of the veterans of the revolution and in the 20s there were 20 different governments in in france between 1920 and 1929 uh, the country just goes back and forth between de gaulle and mitterrand is still oscillating the same way and that divide cuts all the way through all western civilization uh, to this day, I believe, the uh, birthday of Napoleon cannot be celebrated in France. Isn't that right? That's true. And yet Napoleon is the greatest hero in all French history. And the most popular to the this day. The most popular, yes. Well, the hypocrisy that marks men like Robespierre and politicians on all sides does go back to John Locke and to the premise that the intellectual elite, the political elite, the scientific planning elite represent the voice of reason and of virtue in the world. And therefore, they are exempt from the ordinary laws of humanity and they have a right to rule us and to make decisions for us. And they know better than we do what we need. Well, what's good for us? James I said, I govern not according to the common will, but the common weal. And that was the most succinct expression of their attitude. They brought up the will of the people. This was supposed to be the will of the people. But they were the people, and everyone else was cattle. They spoke for the people. Robespierre and his crowd spoke for the people. No one else was allowed to speak. Now, this is a pretty familiar situation for the modern Americans. Yes, if you oppose this same revolutionary elite, you are a fascist, you are a reactionary, you are by definition evil because you have opposed the voice of virtue. Yes. Well, that's it. It was a satiric phrase, the voice of virtue. And Tom Lipscomb, the editor, used it as a title. Uh, I, my original title was Robespierre, the Fool as Revolutionary. Mm -hmm. And uh, I hope someday to see a second edition out carrying the proper title. Robespierre is interesting. He was dictator of France, although actually, technically, he was only head of a committee, <coughs> Committee of Public Safety. But he was the unchallenged dictator for 90 days. Now, 90 days is not a very long time. It's about the lifespan of a fruit fly. And yet he was elevated into the pantheon of historic personalities by the left and he has been maintained in that high position ever since. Have you any idea of how many men have risen to the top and fallen in a period of weeks or months? I mean, they're all dismissed as footnotes of history, and yet this one idiot, this one murderous idiot, is held aloft. R. R. Palmer, who was with Princeton University for many, many years, and is considered our leading American authority on the French Revolution, 30 years ago wrote that when Robespierre was guillotined, that destroyed the last best hope of democracy in France. And I called him up when I was writing this book. And he wasn't at Princeton, he was at another school, but I found him. And I said, I cannot get over what you had to say about Robespierre and I quoted 
And he was immensely flattered. He said, why? He said, I wrote that 30 years ago. He said, I think it's just marvelous that you feel that way. I said, well, don't misunderstand me. I said, I really called up to find out if you've changed your mind in view of events since then. And there was a hesitation, and he said, why should I? I said, after Stalin, after Lenin, you see no reason to change your mind about Robespierre? He said, no, not in the least. I said, well, then I feel sorry for you, and I hung up. Mm-hmm. Well, very few people realize to how great an extent both Marx and Lenin wrote on the French Revolution, studied it, and made it their pattern. Now, the interesting thing is that Robespierre, who is regarded as so great a man that all the way through school I was taught that he was one of the greatest men of all history, did very little other than kill a sizable portion of the population of France. Well, they set prices and wages. They made it a criminal offense to use gold. You had to use their paper money. Mm -hmm. He suppressed Christianity, and he persecuted the church, of course, but he allowed all kinds of strange cults to continue. Mm -hmm. Uh, Officially, they revolutionary government was against all religion, but in practice it was only against Christianity. Yes, they worked to promote Freemasonry, occultists and satanic groups, any group that was hostile to Christianity. They did several things that were unusual. The first thing, of course, was to overthrow the religion of a country in the name of anti-religion. I don't believe that's ever happened before in the history of the world. But of course, to say that they had no religion of their own is untrue. They had a religion which every liberal in the world today believes in. Mm -hmm. The religion of the elite. The religion of the self-appointed elite that has a right to teach all the rest of us and tell all the rest of us what to do and what to think. The other things that they did that were rather interesting is that they introduced the idea of the purge. Uh, I think we've referred to this before. Uh, I think it's important to go into again. Well, the purge, of course, is a medical term to get rid of the feces. So to use that term to human beings is to epitomize that they consider the people whom they're going to purge as simply feces, the, mm-hmm. the, the waste, waste product of society. Yes. And it was accompanied by public confessions in the Jacobin Club and the other left-wing clubs, radical clubs. You had to get up and confess your sins publicly. This was, of course, stolen from Christianity. The idea of of confession originally was public. In the early days of Christianity, you got up before everyone in the congregation and you admitted what your sins were, and you were given a penance and you were forgiven. Well, every one of the revolutionaries had to get up and purge himself of his sins. He had to admit that he had done this or done that. That was, uh, I think, somewhat unusual. And that, of course, has been carried on through the public confession episodes of the Chinese Cultural Revolution, the early stages of the Soviet Revolution, and every left-wing revolution ever since. Every one of these steps, and I guess the most original of all, was to destroy an entire class of people, to murder an entire class of people for the crime of having been born in the wrong group. Babies young women, old men, without distinction. They were out to destroy all the aristocrats, all the priests, all the nuns, and anyone else who didn't agree with them. Now, I can't think of any precedent in all history 
where a government set out to slaughter its own people when the people were unresisting. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, very interesting to realize how we have been given a warped idea of the French Revolution all the way through school, as I mentioned earlier, I was given all kinds of false ideas about it. Uh, one scholar actually held some years back that the reign of terror was misnamed because only a handful of people, perhaps 40, oh. were executed. Oh. And, when and he did he have a doctorate? Was he teaching in a school? Oh, yes. That criminal? <laughs> of course, it was by the millions. But I think one of the greatest illusions uh, propagated by teaching concerning the French Revolution, the Russian, and others is that these were spontaneous rebellions against despotic rule. And uh, they were anything but spontaneous. They were led from the top. And instead of improving things, however bad the regime of Louis the Sixteenth may have been, that of the revolution was far, far worse. Well, Louis the Sixteenth felt that it was criminal for a monarch to order his army to fire on his own people. Yes, which was a weakness on his part. And uh, incidentally, the Shah of Iran had the same idea. Mm -hmm. And both fell. And both result. fell as a result. Because if you don't defend yourself, of course, you will be defeated. But the, the, the French event carried every single step of the formula so well that at the, by the time I got through and I was ready to write this book, I felt Anyone who understands the French Revolution will understand all left-wing revolutions. Yes. And anyone who doesn't understand the French Revolution will, is going to be doomed to be victimized by a left-wing revolution. That's the reason that they teach it in the Kremlin to the leaders of the various national groups in various parts of the world where they intend to subvert. They bring them in and they have the greatest record there's this, a number of mysteries, as George Lord Acton said about the French case. He said every so often the smoke appears to diminish, and we think we're going to see the hands of the managers. And then he said all is covered over again. There is a persistent argument that arises again and again that there is a particular group who, were, who created and masterminded the French Revolution. Nestor Webster and others think it was the Jews. I don't. I don't think it was the Jews. I don't think that it was any particular national group. I think that it was a combination of factors. I think the Masons had something to do with it. I think that English money and agents had something to do with it. The agents of Frederick the Great and Catherine the Great, they had a hand in it. There were a number of people who combined in this great historic event but prior to it, there was this long period of attack upon the French culture from within by the intellectuals who severed all the roots, you might say, the fabric which held the French culture together. They attacked the history, they attacked the religion, they attacked the church, they attacked the priests, they attacked the nuns, they attacked the court, they attacked the army, they attacked every group and they at the same time that they attacked these groups and invented all kinds of dirty stories about them they took on an aspect that we see today where pornographic publications get holy and indignant when they discover sin in others mm -hmm. yes and it's amazing when you see the people who are indignant yes and you know the way they live and you wonder at the nerve of them talking about any kind of scandal anywhere. But if this is continued, and it did continue 
uh, Robespierre read this kind of literature when he was in school. It was forbidden, but he read it. He went to a Jesuit school, or rather he went to a Christian school. The Jesuits had been thrown out of France at that point. At the end of that time, there wasn't anyone left who would defend France. France. One of the last, one of the last ministers of finance, called in a bunch of very wealthy people in an attempt to help the government deficit and the tax system and so forth. And he prefaced his remarks by saying, "I realize that the history of France is one of criminality." Hmm. I was given all kinds of uh, material to read, assigned reading, heard lectures about the oppressive system of taxation uh, under the Louis. Mm. And it was only about 15, 17 years after I finished my uh, studies undergraduate and graduate, that I began to encounter the data about taxation, which made clear that taxation before the revolution was very, very light compared to what France has had ever since. Well, compared to what they have now. Yes. Compared to what we have. Yes. <laughs> I mean... You know that the only difference, I guess, is between then and now is that there was not a great technological gap mm -hmm. in terms of weapons. If you had guns, you could have guns just as good as the army. Now, of course, that's no longer possible. Mm -hmm. So we have weapons of control today that were, didn't exist then, though so rebellions were easier to mount in a physical sense. But the real control was taken away from the king. First the long build-up, and then the gradual infiltration of the idea all through the middle class that there was a possibility to attain power. Now, the leaders of the revolution were young men in their 20s and early 30s. There were no old men involved. Uh, the old men had written the books and laid the groundwork, as you say, Locke and all the rest. And don't forget, the Age of Reason had a big season in England after the Restoration. After Cromwell, there was a great swing against the church, and uh, there was a corrupt clergy, if it hadn't been for John Wesley and so forth, who knows what would have happened there. But in any event, the revolutionaries were journalists, they were lawyers, they, Marat was a physician, uh, they were what we would call today the, the rising professional class. Mm -hmm. Now, there's, there's something about the modern professional which is interesting. He feels that because he has a certain amount of education and skill in a certain area that he really should have commensurate power in society. Yes. This is a persistent delusion. The idea that if you go to school for 25 or 50 years, you are then entitled to give people orders and tell them what to do. We have a system here where professionals can, can conduct experiments with human beings, which... Uh, an unprofessional would go to prison for doing that. Yes. Well, at any rate, these fellows, and I think of Ralph, one of my friends read this and said Ralph Nader, talking about Robespierre, <laughs> uh, <laughs> that, that self-righteousness, yes. that hatred of luxury, that hatred of, of wealth. He, w he went crazy when he saw the Corvette. It was too racy looking. Well, we have the same self-styled elite who are convinced that anything they did not plan and design and control is therefore degenerate and immoral. And as a result, then as now, the, the same type of person is working to subvert and destroy 
anything that he has not made. Well, it's interesting. Some of the uh, some of the things you know that in Germany, Western Germany, about ten or fifteen years ago, there was a very popular soft porno publication, soft porno and political radical publication. It's quite got a big circulation. And then it was discovered with a certain amount of shock that it was funded by the Soviets. Mm-hmm. Well, the same thing is true in the French Revolution. All kinds of publications, semi-pornographic, which combined radical politics with pornography, appeared all over the place. And they ranged all the way from cartoons up to scholarly journals. They covered every aspect of what you could put on paper in terms of persuasion, even posters. And uh, the odd thing about it, or the unusual thing about it, is after the revolution succeeded, they turned very puritanical. All those publications were immediately suppressed, as in Cuba, Mm -hmm. after Castro, as in the Soviet Union, after Lenin, as in Berlin after Hitler. And the revolutionary, you see, is really, it's sort of a reverse priest. You might say almost a priest gone bad. Mm-hmm. He, he calls on all these kind of idealistic slogans. He prides himself on being austere, of being above the weaknesses of the flesh, and if given a chance, would lock people up. Yes. Well, we are living in a revolutionary climate, in other words. Very definitely. There isn't a single thing that I found in the pre-revolutionary climate of Paris, 1788, that we don't have. This is why it is so important for the opposition to destroy the growing Christian movement in this country. And this is why some of these television personalities who have exploited uh, Christianity are so evil because they have played into the hands of these uh, people who are out to destroy our world, to destroy Christianity, to take over and become the lords over man. Well, they, it isn't simply the scandals that have appeared at the PTL and that sort of thing, which I really deplore alone so much as I do the fact that they attained tremendous audiences. They mm-hmm. ha- These are men of great eloquence who slided over every one of our national problems. Yes. Never attacked any of the conditions that are threatening our liberties. Mm -hmm. They put everything into a sort of musical chorus of theological banalities. Yes. Banalities is the word for it. What we have seen is the evasion of the problems of life in terms of uh, a kind of thing that I think was uh, summed up after World War II in a book written by a rabbi, Peace of Mind, Mm. as though the goal of life is to find peace of mind. We've had... Catholic and Protestant and Jewish uh, leaders writing as though having what you want, having peace of mind, finding yourself, uh, finding your own space, uh, uh, all these trivialities have replaced the kingdom of God. Well, there's the whole... The whole... uh perversion of being born again. I yes. mean, you don't get born again by uh, an excess of enthusiasm. Uh, you, you get born again after a long walk through the desert. 
after great travail. I mean, it's, it resurrection begins first with defeat. Yes. And anyone who thinks that this is an easy or a pleasant experience has never gone through it. That's right. And here we are, faced with these trivial monsters who claim to be our betters, telling us that they've got a plan to bring heaven on earth, and it's the kind of heaven that would kill us all. <laughs> yes. Well, we are thus in a revolutionary climate. We have some very serious problems. And the answers are only soluble from a Christian perspective. A Christian perspective that applies the whole Word of God to every area of life and thought. One of the problems we face in this country is that so many people, as a result of their schooling, have been trained to believe that there is a similarity between the French Revolution and our War of Independence. The two, of course, were very emphatically different, and ours was not a true revolution. It was anything but a revolution. It was a separation from a country that was limiting the liberties of free colonies. However, the French Revolution is increasingly regarded as the model, as the attempt by man to take over his own destiny. And that perspective uh, marked one book written a few years back, and I forget the title of it, but it was a sociological study of a popular sort which held that in order to appreciate what the future could offer us, we would have to understand the implications of the French Revolution and man taking control of his own destiny. Well, man trying to take control of his own destiny has been part of the original sin since man was created. And... Of course, our destiny is beyond our control. We don't know when we were not in command of being born. We're not in command of dying. And uh, in command of very little in between, for that matter. Uh, I, I think the practice of calling it the American Revolution is a deliberate attempt to muddy the waters yes. and to and to make the word revolution and the idea of revolution respectable. Yes. And, of course, they're constantly quoting Jefferson, who says the tree of liberty should be watered with the blood of martyrs every 20 years or so. Uh, Jefferson was a many-sided individual, and you can quote him on almost any topic and find three opinions in his writings. The... The fact of the matter is that anyone who gets out of school and carries what he's been told around in his head without reviewing them and without sometime later on doing some more reading in that area is not an educated person. It's just a person who has had some schooling. And uh, the... American version of the French Revolution would astonish the French. They know better. They still have family records. They know who was killed. They know that it was a bloody mess and that they've never gotten off their feet since. They've never had a stable government since then. They've never been able to maintain a, a ongoing administrative structure since then. The church never recovered in France. The army never recovered. The aristocracy never recovered. The French Revolution, just to put you into one industrial phase, one of the things it did was it broke up all the big estates. It limited French farms. So it thereby, and it also passed legislature in one form or another against capitalism because they weren't going to be a nation of shopkeepers like the English. Consequently, France industrially lagged. While Germany soared, England soared, 
the United States soared, France remained moored in the past, babbling about uh, liberty, freedom, equality, all this nonsense. I mean, to this day, you argue with a Frenchman, and it's it's a uh, really difficult and distressing situation because they take absurd positions and they get very passionate about them. But France is only recently joined the industrial world. The French Revolution held France back for at least 80 years. Mm -hmm. There's another aspect of this that we're rarely told, but I had a glimpse of it in a most telling manner. About 15, 16 years ago, I was listening to KFAC, the good music station in Los Angeles, and they played a short symphonic piece or perhaps you could say a, a symphonietta, a small symphony. Breathtakingly beautiful. Very, very remarkable piece, which I've never heard since. And then said this was one of the two surviving compositions by the man who before the revolution was recognized to be the greatest composer in France, and perhaps one of the greatest ever known in Europe. But nothing else had survived mm -hmm. except two short pieces. The amount of the past and its culture the and its achievements that was destroyed by the revolutionaries Fire. was far-reaching. Oh, yes. So that we have a very limited knowledge of many of the areas of cultural achievement in pre-revolutionary France. Well, also, don't forget that one of the pre-revolutionary conditions in France, one of the conditions that led to the revolution, was the rise of female power. Yes. Now, this is, this is never discussed, and of course this is a very bad thing to bring up at this particular <laughs> period of time. But when Napoleon decided to put an end to disorders, which had persisted for quite a long time, he sent the army out and he said, have the people pick out uh, the demonstrators and mischief makers and give them summary justice. Some of his advisors said, what about the Jacobins? And he said, who were they? Well, of course, he was their boy. He was their protege for a long time. He was a protege of Robespierre's. So, of course, he knew who they were, but he said, oh, well. He said, France had no government. France was governed by women. Mm -hmm. Now France has a government, and the French will obey. Yes. And they did. Now, it was true. Pompadour and the various mistresses of the Louis, the last three Louis, exerted an enormous influence. Marie Antoinette was very influential. Uh, Louis XVI was not as intelligent. And there was a great feminist movement. I was looking up, I had to look up because I can't remember these things. One of the feminine leaders of the revolution during the, on page 83, during the uh, attack upon the Bastille, which was empty at the time, there was a, a pretty woman whose real name was Anne Turan, well-known courtesan who rode along on the barrel of the weapon wearing a tricolor. Mm -hmm. Now Anne became one of the great female leaders of the revolutionary group and uh, at various demonstrations she was very prominent and the women were following her and she made speeches and of course she wasn't the only one but she was the most outstanding. After the revolution turned sour, after the people began to lose everything that they had, after Paris began to look like, one visitor to Paris at that point said it looked like an old clothes shop because the women 
were lined up on the sidewalks with pictures and pieces of furniture and clothing and whatnot to sell for food, which was the same sort of thing that happened in Leningrad, or, or, or St. Petersburg, rather, and in Moscow, and in Berlin, and in all these mm -hmm. ends of the rev after the revolution. Then the women turned on Anne and beat her up. Beat her up. And then along came the revolutionary authorities who picked her up and threw her into prison <laughs> because she had become an embarrassment to them. Yes. Now, it was interesting that the same thing was true in the Spanish Revolution. The, the left-wing movement that overthrew Alfonso XIII and set up the Spanish Republic the straight communist revolution which most Americans never heard of because uh -huh. our press never reported the stages of it, but it went down the line of the French Revolution. One of the aspects was the feminist movement, La Passionaria, got up in the Cortez and said to one of the conservative members, for your position you will be punished and he was murdered later that night mm -hmm. after Franco took over she fled to Russia she came back by the way after Franco's death 83 still spouting the same thing mm -hmm. you know history as it really was is the most fascinating of all yes. subjects well one of the things also that marked the French Revolution was uh, thinking like this, Sanju's statement, children belong to the state, as you point out on page 224 of your book. And Sanju's thought boys should be taken from their families at five. And history was revised as a part of their new enlightenment. And the past was seen only as a record of barbarism. So, to this day, we look on the past as barbaric, and wisdom was born with these uh, well, media they, elite. They renamed the years. Yes. They started with the year one. Mm -hmm. They renamed the seasons. They renamed the months. They renamed the days of the week. <laughs> they were going to, everything was going to begin from them. Yeah. They were going to start the new world, and the new humanity, the new everything. The new creation, and very literally. And the, we need to take that seriously. The Soviets picked up the theme, but every time there's a crisis in the Kremlin, they say there will be no Thermidor. Mm -hmm. They will never allow any of their military men to get to the point that Napoleon reached mm -hmm. of popularity. Never. That's why Marshal Zhukov and all the rest were put down by Stalin as soon as World War II was over. And Tukhachevsky before the war. Yes. Well, right now, there is no voting member from the military on the Politburo. Well, look at what we've done. We have muzzled our military. Yeah. They're not even allowed to speak without the permission of the State Department. And the, the Secretary of Defense's office must have a copy in advance of their talk, and it must be censored. General Singlob was destroyed. His career was destroyed because, off the record, he told a reporter who asked him what he thought about Carter's plan to pull our troops out of South Korea. Off the record. The reporter broke the promise, went ahead and printed it, that was Mr. Singlob's, General Singlob's uh, great crime, having an opinion. Well, we saw what uh, putting civilians in charge of military strategy has done for us in Vietnam. Well, yes, we had this Texas school teacher, Lyndon Johnson. I always think of this with real amazement. Here's a man who got into office with uh, ass out of his trousers, no shoes practically, who wound up with $25 million, never had a job that wasn't on the government payroll, and there's never been a word raised about his ethics. Yes, and his wife, who had nothing, is supposedly the source of the money. But, going back to this revolutionary thing, muzzling the military was a very important step in the diminution of American liberty.
Yes. Because that set up a barrier between what we could know about national defense and what we can't. The theater, the theater in those days, they had homosexual costume balls, you know. They had mm -hmm. homosexual dances. They had a growth of child prostitution. It was amazing. The prostitutes were, went around accompanied by little children, and it was the children that were for sale. To read about Paris in those days, and not only Paris, but Marseille and all the other cities in France is, is to take a walk through Greenwich Village. Mm -hmm. Well, as you point out, anything their critics did or said was automatically bad because they were critics of the government. But they issued uh, a statement which began, all is permitted those who act in the revolutionary direction. That's exactly what Bernard Balin said. Bernard Balin, the great doyen of American historiographers right now, when this book came out, this nonsensical book called Roots, Somebody pointed out that it is replete with historical error. And they said to Dr. Balin, who is hailed as a great historian, what do you think about that? He said, well, it's all right so long as it's in the right direction. Yes. And I thought of the French Revolution. Yes. You can lie, and it's the truth, provided you lie for them. You're lying in a good cause. Yes. Yes. And none of this, the interesting thing about it is that none of the final stages of the revolution were accompanied by any explanation to the people of what these men planned to do. They went step by step. First, they demanded a more democratic voting, and that they changed the Estates General into the General Assembly. Then they demanded a constitutional a new constitution and a referendum on it, and that was achieved. Then they demanded new votes in order to send in a newly elected General Assembly under the new constitution. Well, by that time, they had a constitutional government similar to that of Britain. This was what Mirabeau had wanted. But they weren't going to stop there. The Jacobins then pushed inside the General Assembly to push the monarchy further out. Louis finally got scared and tried to flee the country, and they seized and arrested him because that was a crime. Suddenly he had betrayed the revolution, and that was the beginning of the trials in the legislature and the guillotine. Yes. Now, here we are moving more and more toward putting the president on trial. There were a great many of, uh, of this sort of persons who were deeply grieved and disappointed and angered that President Ford pardoned President Nixon. They wanted to put him in prison. Mm -hmm. And they would like to put Reagan in prison. And they never considered putting Lyndon Johnson in prison, well, given no, all his Of course offenses. not. Nor, nor, nor were they shocked at the call girls that Kennedy had yes. in the White House. Yes. Well, the banner of the French Revolution, its slogan, Liberty, Equality, Fraternity, is always given to us in its truncated form, as you point out in your book, because the full slogan is liberty, equality, fraternity, or death. That's right. Agree with us or die. Absolutely. You are a contra. You're a counter-revolutionary yes. if you don't agree. Yes. And I noticed that uh, the word contra is has been accepted here. You're countering the revolution in yes. Nicaragua. Well, of course, the difference between France at that time... Now, France did have international enemies because it was the largest and the richest country in Europe. The government was broke, but the people were wealthy. 
As the revolution progressed, the enemies of France began to gather, and eventually, of course, the Germans sent in an army uh, from various parts of Germany. An army was assembled that marched against the French. Well, then the French produced the People's Army, you might say. Mm -hmm. And since guns were interchangeable in those days, and cannon didn't really mean a great deal, horses were horses no matter who had them, the battles were interesting because, in effect, the revolution conscripted all the people, and the rhetoric was beautiful. I'll tell you, the rhetoric, Robespierre's eloquence was so great that I didn't dare quote him in this book. Hmm. I did not quote any of the revolutionary leaders but deliberately because if I did it would have distorted the book. The rhetoric of the revolution was so arresting and so exciting and so noble that it sweeps the mind away from the facts of what they were doing. Hmm. So therefore I wrote only about what they did and not what they said. And it's a very unusual book in the French Revolution because of that. And it's a, it was a deliberate technique. Now, well, the rhetoric of politics today is full of concern for the poor and the needy, the downtrodden, and it's just as dishonest as the rhetoric of the French Revolution. Well, let's listen to the contra hearings. Did you ever hear anything like the uh, expostulations and the indignation of these highly moral representatives and senators that we have? I mean, there they are. Their their chins wobble in indignation as they uh, question what happened to the money. Mm -hmm. Who did you? Who knew what? They they succeeded in confusing everybody in the United States. Mm -hmm. But what I was leading to on the question of France, France revolutionary armies defeated their enemies, and of course they had a general like Napoleon. They had some other good ones, and went on to create for a while the French Empire short-lived, but nevertheless it left a lasting scar in the culture of Europe. But we in the United States, if we get embroiled in an internal revolution, can rest assured that many of the agents of that revolution are allied or will be allied with this great international Goliath that is moving against us. Yes. So what we will see here is not only a domestic revolution in the sense of new rulers, but rulers allied with the worst rulers that the world has seen since the days of uh, the pagans. Mm -hmm. And we would be maneuvered like Czechoslovakia, be maneuvered like Romania, into the hands of the Soviet. Yes. That's because the revolution today is Marxist. It's a left-wing revolution. It isn't a right-wing revolution. And that's the thing that we have to, one way or another, Americans are going to have to wake up to the fact that this is not simply words, this is real. They're going to have to, the cons Christians have moved well, but they have not realized their common danger. I think the time is long gone when people can afford denominational disputes in the Christian mm -hmm. community. Yes. We're up against Satan. Some few years back, State Senator Bill Richardson uh, said something to me when I was speaking to the state senators that I've never forgotten. He said most people underestimate the intelligence of these people here in Sacramento. He said they are highly intelligent men. Their problem is not a lack of intelligence, but a short-range vision. They cannot visualize anything beyond 90 days because the average voter is like themselves, existentialist, mm. has no vision beyond 90 days. Not going anywhere. No. Just trying to live well. Yes. And what a politician has done more than 90 days in the past 
is forgotten. Is forgotten, except in very rare cases. Well, this is our problem. The men in the Senate right now are not thinking of the future of oh, this country. Oh, they're thinking only of the next election. Yes. They want to get the White House. Yes. And they think everything is going to go along just as fine as dandy. The next president is not going to have any problem. If he's a Democrat, he can do anything he wants. Mm -hmm. Well, they're wrong, mm -hmm. because the revolution doesn't go backward. It doesn't go backward. No. Mr. Hart couldn't do what Mr. Kennedy did. The press didn't protect Mr. Hart, because the press is loose. It's like a t uh, uh, jackals in the street. Do you remember Garrett Garrett, who was editor in the late 20s, I think, and in, in the 30s Did of the write? Saturday Evening Post? Oh, no, I, I don't Ooh. think so. Uh, a Did he write A Mess of Pottage? Yes. Yes, I remember that book. And yes. he also wrote a little book after a few years of Roosevelt, and the title of it was The Revolution Was. Yes, he did. He did. He, 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 Tremendous. He was, he was right on target. Yes. And the only thing that surprises me about it is how long it's taking. Mm -hmm. This, of course, is, a, is an advantage. This is a great advantage because perhaps because of the American uh, addiction to euphemisms, the American language today is becoming a, 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 a mask for communication, uh, a substitute for communication. I mean, I hear the weatherman saying, rain activity. <laughs> and uh, that drives me right up the wall. They, they will never use one word where 17 will do. I think the abysmal level of thinking came out in that uh, account you gave at the staff meeting last week about the U.S. Navy. Why don't you cite that? In the Persian Gulf, how shall we protect our Navy? Oh, yes. The, I heard that on the radio. The fellow said the, the issue that's beginning to arise to many people in Washington is how shall we protect our Navy? <laughs> <laughs> Well, perhaps because the revolution is proceeding in this snail-like, blind fashion, mm -hmm. there is a chance. But I've seen, and you have too, the Christian community take on all kinds of uh, new and invigorated life and then begin to fission off into single issues. The right to life people the prayer in the school people, mm -hmm. something else over here, something else over there, all individually fine, but all cottage industry stuff. Yes. In the meantime, the revolution is moving along a single track, mm -hmm. and they have a slogan, no enemies on the left. We seem to have a slogan, no, no friends on the right. Mm-hmm. Yes. Well, there is no future for this country except in terms of a genuine reawakening of the Christian community and a concern for Christian reconstruction in every area of life and thought. We have a problem unparalleled in all of history because for the first time all the world is involved and the future of the world in a great measure depends on what happens in the United States. Well, I think that's true. And I do think that we are in a better position than the French were in the 1780s or the Russians in the teens or the Germans in the early 30s. We do have a Christian community and neither of those countries did. Remember that book from Under the Rubble? Yes. And you remember what the Christian thinkers had told the revolutionaries? They said, you are yes. descending into the abyss. They predicted everything that was going to happen to them. They said, you are moving into hell. Now, the revolutionaries killed every, every copy of that book but one. But one. Edith Myers will have an article, a long article on that, 
in the next issue of the journal. Marvelous. Yes. Marvelous. Well, well, we do have what they don't have, and therefore we could. Really, if the revolution succeeds here, there is no excuse for us. Yes. Because we know all that's been being happening. And I've got one other thing I'd like to say, and that is that with all the faults of the American people, which are faults of prosperity and, and ignorance and naivete and so forth, nevertheless, when you look at the other side, yes, we are a great tolerant nation. Yes. Well, thank you, Otto, and thank you all for listening. It's been a delight to share this time with you, and we trust you have found uh, interesting what we have been discussing. Let me remind you that if you are interested in Robespierre, The Voice of Virtue by Otto Scott, uh, only a limited number of copies now remain, not very many. So do write to Ross House Books. It's $9.95 and a dollar and a half for postage and handling. It's P.O. Box 67, Vallecito, California, 95251. Thank you for listening, and good night. Authorized by the Calcedon Foundation. Archived by the Mount Olive Tape Library. Digitized by ChristRules.com.